Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk. So it's our great honor to have uh, Professor Bruce Max visiting MSR. Uh, so Bruce uh, got her all degrees from MIT, and uh, he was a postdoc at MIT for some time, and then a research scientist at NEC Institute in Princeton. And then he was at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and then from uh, 1994 to 2009, and then most recently as a professor in the computer science department. And uh, during his tenure in Carnegie Mellon, uh, Professor uh, Max actually helped to launch Akamai technology, right? He spent some time off and then launched Akamai technology, and he served as VP of Research and Development. And today, he is still affiliated with Akamai and then still serves as VP for Research. And then uh, Professor Max has a lot of paper words and has served as many, like, top conference committees. I will not go into detail. So without further ado, uh, let's hear uh, Professor Max talk. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I always like to encourage people to ask questions, and es especially with a, a small audience. In fact, in a small audience, you can ask e even more difficult questions. So, but please feel free to pepper me with talks, uh, pepper my talk with questions. I only have 22 slides, uh, so so I kind of expect that. Um, I I'm really happy to be here. This is my first visit to um, Microsoft Research. Are we in Redmond? What city are we in? Redmond. Um, I have been to the mothership, I mean Microsoft Research Silicon Valley already. Um, uh, but still, uh, I, I'm glad to be here. Um, what I want to do today is, is talk about um, a new uh, hybrid content delivery system that uh, has been developed by Akamai. And we've done a, a, a measurement study, and there's a whole bunch of collaborators here. Um, the three most important are three graduate students, um, Ming Chen Zhao is one of Andreas Haberlin's students at the University of Pennsylvania. Parjat Aditya is one of Peter Druschel's system, uh, uh, students at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. And Ian Lin is one of my students at Duke. And then um, <coughs> Bill Wishon is an employee at Akamai. Um, so what is a hybrid content delivery system? What, what I'm talking about is a, it, it's a system that is composed of both a traditional content delivery network infrastructure, the kind of thing that Akamai has been operating for over a decade. So you have a lot of centrally managed servers deployed all over the world, and their job primarily is to deliver content, um, like Windows Update is always a good one. Um, and then in addition to that traditional sort of fixed infrastructure, uh, you also employ a peer-to-peer -peer component. So you have clients who have installed our software on their machines. And these clients uh, also serve as uh, content servers. And, and sometimes when a, a client wants to download a file, it will get some of the pieces of it from the fixed infrastructure, some of the pieces of it from, from peers, or maybe sometimes all from peers or all from the fixed infrastructure. Um, one thing that people often ask is, doesn't this seem like uh, a weird mix, like peer-to-peer -peer systems have been maybe viewed as the alternative or the enemy of content delivery networks. And, and this reminds me of a, a book I read called The Pope's Elephant, where there was a, a, a pope in the 12th century who loved to collect exotic animals, and he had an elephant. And people in Europe believed that the rhinoceros was the natural enemy of the elephant. And so someone managed to procure a rhinoceros for the pope and bring it to, to Italy where it was placed in a large arena with the elephant to see if they would fight. But in fact, they're both herbivores, and they have no interest in fighting each other. But the crowds panicked the elephant, and it, he went rampaging you know, out of the arena and through the city streets, which is probably how this talk is going to go. Uh, but uh, the, the point is that, in fact, I think there's a nice synergy and a sweet spot in the design space here to combine peer-to-peer -peer content delivery with uh, fixed infrastructure. And, and from the, the content delivery network's point of view, what's sort of nice is that uh, you get a low cost mechanism for delivering content. Okay? We're not paying for the bandwidth, we're not paying for the hardware. Um, at the same time, 
the peer-to-peer -peer system has this highly reliable system to fall back on if anything goes wrong. If you can't find a peer with the content, you get it from the CDN. The CDN manages uh, everything. It keeps track of which peers have which content. And so it's, it's able to um, uh, provide this sort of backstop that, that the peer-to-peer -peer system can rely on. So I want to give you some statistics first about Akamai's traditional content delivery network so that we can contrast those with the, the current peer-to-peer -peer deployment. So this is a, a marketing graph of where Akamai's servers are located. And, um, but these numbers are fairly accurate. Within the last six months, this was an accurate snapshot. There are, there are about 85,000 servers. I know Microsoft actually operates a lot more servers than we do, but that's still a big number. Um, we're, we're in about 1,800 distinct physical locations around the world. Um, this makes us the, the, the most distributed network. Um, we're on 1,000 different ISPs in about 80 countries. And uh, some, some trends in growth here, uh, let's see. So this number is, well, growing at about 50% per year. And um, so that's, that's, uh, that's because the traffic is growing at 100% per year and has every year for, for the last 12 years. The servers are getting faster and the networks are getting faster, so the number of servers deployed doesn't grow quite as fast. Um, here are some, some statistics. Uh, these are some peak statistics. So within the last year, um, the, the peak bit rate that we serve, this is like all of our servers simultaneously pumping out bits, was about 5 terabits per second. The request rate, this is number of HTTP requests we see uh, simultaneously, 16.7 um, million per second. Um, I, I think we're seeing, these two statistics are interesting to me. We see about... Uh, a trillion HTTP requests per day. And so that's interesting because, you know, there's, there's only less than 10 billion people in the world. Um, and also the number of unique client IPs that we see per day is, uh, is about 500 million. Okay, so that's the number of distinct IP addresses that make HTTP requests. And this ratio is interesting, too, that there's a factor of 2,000 here. So the number of requests per client is extremely high. Now, part of that is that um, you have NATs, and so there can be many, many clients behind some addresses. Also, we get many, many, many requests of the form, has this content been modified? And we say, no, it, your cached copy is fine. So the, 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 um, the average size of an answer that we give back is about 30 kilobytes. Okay, that's grown from 10 kilobytes uh, um, 12 years ago, but um, the, it's dominated by these very quick answers that say, you know, the content hasn't been modified. So, yeah. So among the traffic, like, uh, do you have a percentage of video traffic? Uh... I don't have that statistic, but the percentage of video traffic is definitely on the rise. Um, if it's not 50%, I wouldn't be surprised if it hits that at some time in the near future. And Akamai is, is the deliverer for a lot of popular video traffic. We're one of Netscape's, sorry, not Netscape's, Netflix's, uh, you, you know, um, vendors. We deliver that. We deliver um, Major League Baseball and lots of other videos. So that's definitely on the rise. A question. Um, in your last slide, you mentioned the number of servers is growing at about 50% annual rate. Yes. Um, how about the number of pops and the other um, basic... Well, the number of pops is, is not growing as fast. And, and the reason for that is that... Um, it, well, it's always easier to add more capacity to a pop. I, I, yeah, I can imagine it shouldn't grow as fast. But it's hard, it's hard because... I, one thing I should say is that most of our traffic is served out of POPs where we don't pay for bandwidth or power. So we, we started out when we were a small company, and this is kind of what any n new entry into the CDN market has to do. Um, we had to go into commercial co-location centers where we, we served, um, where we paid for rack space, we paid for bandwidth, and uh, 
you know, we were just like anybody else who was wanted to host their website in that data center. Um, but once we started to serve a lot of traffic, we could go into small ISPs, uh, big companies, universities, uh, and ISPs in foreign countries and say, look, we can tell you right now at peak every day, you know, we're pumping 20 megabits per second into your network from outside. We can cut that down by a factor of 10 or more if you'll host our servers. And so most of the pops and most of the deployments, every, almost every new pop is of that form. But it takes time to negotiate all these small deployments. Just, just get a sense, I mean, how much is the growth rate? 10% a year? I mean, how much the top growth? Oh, I mean, uh, just, it's yeah. probably a little less than that, but yeah, something like that. Yeah, you're always looking for new opportunities. Yeah. Um, I, there are some new ideas about how to increase our, our diversity here. I mean, one of them, which I'll talk about today, is this peer-to-peer -peer system. Uh, another is there's an effort to allow network appliance vendors to build mini Akamai servers into their appliances, which would then report back to Akamai's accounting system. So that would also add diversity. Um, but that's not really rolled out yet. This um, so, so the, the whole architecture is two tiers, or all pops are created equal? Originally, all pops were created equal. Now there are some mega pops that really kind of serve uh, other Akamai pops, because with content like video, when it's really massive, it, it you know if you look at the number of servers per pop, it's only on average here about forty or something. And in fact, the distribution is kind of skewed. There's a lot of very small pops, and then there's some really, really big pops. So yeah, there's, to some extent, you could say it's kind of two-tiered. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's really even three-tiered. There's like a, a dozen massive storage centers. They're not really pops. They're not really designed to be, they're not using our web servers. They're just massive storage centers. Then there are a small number of big pops that are, for serving content to other Akamai pops. And then there are all the other pops, which is the vast majority. So do you, does Akamai run its own backbone, or is it all just? No, we do not run our own backbone. So it's a difference between Akamai and, and Google, for example. We don't have our own backbone. Um, we, we don't run, we, we, we do collect BGP feeds. We have about 1,200 that we collect from around the world for sort of mapping, network mapping purposes, but we don't actually run any routing protocols or we don't own or lease any fiber. I mean, there might be an exception here or there, but we don't run a backbone. But do you peer with ISPs at all, or do your hosting we, providers We care? do a little bit, um, but we're mostly peering with other ISPs in, in kind of a contorted way. So one of the things we do is we sometimes peer with ISPs, but we use it so, let me give you an example. There's a network in Switzerland called Switch that um, Simon Leinen uh, works for. Yeah. And Simon allows some of his neighboring ISPs to fetch traffic from Akamai servers inside Switch. And what he does is he uses BGP to advertise to us which prefixes we're allowed to serve out of his network. That's just like reusing the BGP protocol for some other purpose. Um, you may have seen there was this paper by Craig Labovitz at SIGCOM in India where he did this study about how much traffic, say, Akamai is delivering. But his study was based on looking at traffic that was coming from one AS to another. And it, and it grossly underestimates Akamai's traffic because very few of our servers are in, our, we do have an AS number, but very few of our servers are in our AS number. They're almost always just plugged into some other ISP. Okay, you, this is great, although we're wandering a little bit off the main topic, uh, but that's okay. Um, okay, so uh, let me tell you about this. Um, this service is called Download Manager, okay? and. Um, for some of the customers, like Cisco, they really use it just as a traditional download manager. They don't use any of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, capabilities. It's just one of these things where, well, you start downloading a file. If you get interrupted, you don't want to have to start from scratch, so you just resume. And it's, a, it's just a download manager. But, uh, and in that case, the, the content gets pulled from the traditional fixed infrastructure CDN. Um, however, uh, the client um, also has 
peer-to-peer -peer capability. It can pull files or parts of files from other clients. Um, so it's a hybrid, and it's based on technology that was developed by a company called Red Swoosh, which Akamai acquired in 2007. And this is one of those rare instances in the industry where you acquire a company and then actually use its technology. And it's rare for Akamai, too. I'm not, you know, so it's, it's a happy success story. And you can see it only took four years um, uh, well, th three years, I guess, before this went into beta operation. And at the time that I collected the data that I'm going to show you, it was a beta product. It was in use with a select group of customers, but it wasn't, they weren't authorized, the sales team wasn't authorized to sell it widely. Now they are. Um, the goal is to deliver really large files at lower cost. Okay, so we'll, we'll see that the file sizes, the typical file sizes that's being used for are gigantic. And when I asked the the marketing team, oh, does this mean it's really for background downloads and is the idea that we can use peer-to-peer -peer technology, we don't care if it's a little slower because this is going on in the background. They said, you might think that, but a lot of people, even for these gigantic files, are sitting there waiting for it to happen. So it's not the right intuition. There, it's, in fact, the major customers right now are online games who are using it to deliver uh, new updates of their software. And to them, cost really matters. It's got to be kept as low as possible. Um, I'm actually I'm doing kind of a fun consulting job right now in which um, I'm uh, <coughs> helping a company that, that has a popular online game uh, deal with the um, authors of bots that, that play the game automatically. And it turns out there's a technological uh, arms race out there. And, and basically... The game companies keep, they keep changing their software on a weekly or even more frequent basis to make it harder for the bots to work, force the bot authors. So every time you log into the game, you've got to re-download a new software version, right? So um, that's, that's one of the types of customers. More and more video is also going onto the system, although at the time I collected these statistics in December 2010, there was not a lot of video. So, so, actually, I have a question about the cost, right? So, uh, without using the peer-to-peer -peer technology, all the bits will come from the fixed infrastructure. Right? So, you mentioned that your server is already deep inside the ISPs, so you are not paying bandwidth, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> um, good question. The economics of all this is is maybe a little confusing at first glance. So, let's first talk about where does Akamai make its money? It gets money from only from the content providers who pay Akamai to deliver content on their behalf. Okay? By the way, Microsoft is one of our biggest and certainly our most important customer. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not really joking about that. It's very important. Um, so uh, now, how do we charge the customers? In the traditional uh, content delivery service, the infrastructure service, to a very, very gross approximation, they get charged based on how many bits we serve for them. Now, it doesn't really work exactly that way anymore. It's usually there's like a fixed price per month, and unless they exceed some some amount by a huge amount, then you know we we don't necessarily really bill exactly by the bit. But but there's a strong tie ultimately between number of bits served from our servers and what we charge our customer. Now, with the peer-to-peer -peer system, the billing currently doesn't work that way. None of the customers that are using peer-to-peer are charged by the bits that the peers themselves serve. Okay? They, so that cost goes away. They, the current billing model for all customers is they get charged by the number of installations of our software. So it's more like a, a software license model for the, for the download manager being on the, the client's machine. But once it's there, they don't get billed based on the number of bytes that are being delivered by the peers. Yeah. Uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer context, how do you stop uh, the file getting corrupted on one peer then being forwarded corrupted towards the other peers? Okay, so that's a good question, and it also points to the advantages of, of having this infrastructure that you can rely on in the back. What we do is, uh, every file that's being downloaded is broken into blocks, and there's a hash value for each block, and it's stored by the fixed infrastructure. So whenever you get a block from a peer, you go download the hash value from from Akamai and check that it matches. Yeah. 
And what mechanisms do you use to verify the trustworthiness of your infrastructure since it's so globally distributed? Okay, so that's a good question. I actually have just finished a different paper on what do you do about the fact that these peers are not trustworthy. We don't rely on TPM. Uh, you cannot, you can't trust them. Okay, that's one reason why maybe you don't want to bill based on what they're reporting up as no, bytes served. About, my question was not about peers. My question was about your own servers. Our own servers. Yeah. Uh, so you have these servers in South Africa yeah. somewhere, or in some island somewhere in the middle of this. What? Like, how, like, <laughs> how do you know that's your server? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, a, 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 a vulnerability is that we don't have a guarantee of physical security of our servers. Okay, so that is that's a problem. Um, um, having said that, you know all, all the kind of standard protections that you can take to protect a server from intrusions, other than somebody who sticks in a boot disk and reboots your server and starts. I guess my, I don't know. That's like how does a client know it's talking to knock on my server and not my server? Well. You know, until we have secure DNS, that's a problem. Okay, there, there is, there are man in the middle attacks. This, of course, can be played against any website. It's not particular to a CDN. So yes, you could do a man in the middle attack. You could feed false hash values in. Um, the uh, there are other things you could do. In the um, okay, so portions of the communications between our infrastructure and the peers do take place using public key based cryptography. So you, setting up SSL sessions, okay? But actually we don't do that for, for very much because it's expensive. I, I'm not sure I answered your question except to say that there are vulnerabilities. It's not easy to close all of these. Like Microsoft updates, right? Even if you could get, insert your own binary into the chain, right? It's gonna be code signed by Microsoft. Microsoft yeah. everybody. But, yeah, they're sure. still protected because there's an additional layer of photography on top. Yeah, but it, it, it's, it, it's fair to say that you know, one of the vulnerabilities you have if you go for this kind of massive deployment where other people are managing the physical, physical security of your machines is you don't have physical security. Right? And we don't, we don't have any people at any of the sites where we have servers. No employees. Um, okay. Um, okay, now the, the download manager is, is the name of the service that's, that's sold to content providers. Um, the software, the client side software is called the net session interface. And this, uh, it runs as a service on Windows or Mac OS. Um, that's really highly intrusive. So there's a major effort going on to have it run just as an application, a user level application. But right now you install it as a service. And um, it provides an API to installation software or the browser. And basically, you can contact the service and say, please download this file for me, and it will go get it. So, so uh, uh, a company can write their own sort of custom looking interface to their download manager, but then call the API to get us to go pull the files. And also, the, brow the browser can do that so you can have like a, just a little, I don't know, um, some kind of JavaScript or Java applet that runs in a browser that will also call the API. Um, one of the things that's also intrusive is that the, the client side software net session tries to stay uh, persistently connected to an Akamai control node, a, a server that's managing the participation of the peers. So it keeps an open TCP connection. If this connection is broken, if it's not possible for the client to talk to a control node, then what happens is the, the, the client stops doing anything peer-to-peer -peer and relies only on downloads directly, to, um, uh, directly from Akamai servers. And part of the reason for that is that, uh, well, there's several reasons. One is all peer assignments are made by Akamai. We tell the peers who they should go fetch content from. So we need to know which peers are online, which peers have which content. And there's no other way to, to say, discover a peer. Um, but one of the nice things about a hybrid system is you always have this fallback that if anything goes wrong with supporting peer-to-peer -peer operation, again, you just drop back to use the content delivery network. Now, one thing I, I, I didn't say about um, 
the economics or the billing model is that, as I said, we're not charging for the bits served by peers. But if you fall back to the CDN, now you're, that portion of the traffic that's being delivered by the CDN is going to be billed using some traditional billing model for the CDN, which probably ultimately does come down to bits served. So anytime you do fall back to the CDN, it's going to cost the customer more money because that's going to be charged at a higher rate. Perverse incentive here, right? Like, if, if the software doesn't work, you get more money from the customer. Yeah, it, it is, but the customer will go elsewhere if the price is too high. So, the other question is why would we do this at all? Again, why, why offer something that seems to be undercutting us, taking away traffic we could serve? And, and the answer is because other people are doing it anyway, and certain customers want this option. So, so I guess I'm asking that why did you go for the different bidding model? That was more aligned with lights. Like, uh, well, I think there's there are a couple reasons. One is that um, I guess we are on the business competitions. So, for example, if I start up a company, well, we have competitors who do bill by the bits served by the peers. We do not. Generally, our competitors do. I, I think there are a couple reasons for this. Um, it makes us more price competitive. Um, there's generally some outrage about the idea that we should be char we would charge for what these peers are doing, delivering bits. Some people think that's just wrong, um, and Stefan especially thinks that's wrong. Uh, no, he says I can see the outrage. He's not outraged yet, but he's he's, he's willing to contemplate that. I, the other thing is that when you don't, when you don't, when you can't see either end of a download, then all of a sudden, it's really hard to know for sure what happened. You know, the opportunities for like click fraud type of abuse are there, okay? Somebody's, two peers start reporting gigantic downloads that never happened, okay? That's, and that's the subject of this, this other work I've been doing, but I'm not going to get into that today, how to, how to prevent that kind of thing from happening. Um, okay, so here's a, a detail. So uh, uh, anybody can download this software. You don't have to register. You don't have to prove who you are. You don't have to authenticate. Um, when someone installs the software, they don't have to provide any identifying information, but we do generate a random and supposedly unique GUID, which is, stands for user ID. I don't know what the G stands for. Okay. Global unique. That's, that's a Microsoft product. <laughs> Globally. This is awesome. I'm learning. Right. Okay. So here's a problem, though. In, in true Microsoft-compatible fashion, your GUID gets stored in, in a file that's something.ini. Okay? We're way, we're like Windows 3.1 compatible in that respect. And uh, it turns out that there are some uh, like enterprises that have made an image, a disk image, that they write to all their machines. And so we've discovered that we have, they're not, this U is wrong. Okay? So there, uh, unfortunately, this has polluted the data set a little bit. And, and we'll see where we have to watch out for it, and I'll talk about some of the measures we're taking uh, so that we can fix this. Um, OK, here's, here is. So is the, new, is the new software generated with locally when it runs to avoid that problem? So the patch we're putting in is that every time you log in, you're going to not only generate a new one, but report the last three or four that you've had. And so what we're going to do is, as a research project, try to untangle this and figure out which ones are being replicated and you know, which, which, how many unique ones there really are. So that's exactly the right idea. Keep generating new ones all the time. Would we trust you that data? <laughs> um, oh, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> we could have a collaboration here. So uh, yeah, so this is showing the number of unique GUIDs um, that, that logged in during each of these months. And uh, so you can see there was, well, the Akamai loves this, looks like there's steady growth. Um, and uh, again, this is probably an underestimate. It's, it's definitely an underestimate of the number of installations because we'll, we'll see examples where it's clear that you can't simultaneously have, you're not supposed to have more than one copy of a GUID log in simultaneously. Sometimes we see hundreds of copies log in simultaneously. 
And that shouldn't be possible if they're all really unique. So, so information is like one, one service. And if, I, if I'm using like multiple content providers, I use just that one service? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's correct. So once you've installed it once, if you have multiple content providers that use it, you don't have to install the software again. Um, yeah, so at the, at, yes, there are. There are, at the time I took these statistics, there were a few dozen. Some of the well-known ones were a, a, a Cisco, who was not using it for peer-to-peer, -peer, Adobe, I don't think they were doing peer-to-peer, NFL.com, and then a lot of game companies. Those are some of the, the names. Um, that was back in December. There, there's more today. Um, okay, this is kind of what the architecture looks like. So you have the peers, and I've shown them up top, and they can communicate with one another, um, but every peer, if it wants to participate in the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, has to keep an open connection to a control plane node. And then we have these edge servers, the traditional edge servers that are there to also provide content and to provide these hashes of the blocks. Um, the protocol is, it's kind of a lot like BitTorrent, okay, where the control nodes are acting as trackers and also they're assigning the peers. So basically when you, you, you want to download something, you go to a control plane node, you say, here's what I want to download. It gives you back a list of up to 40 peers that it believes have the content. And you can start downloading from them and you can launch these requests to your peers simultaneously so that you can take advantage of their aggregate upload bandwidth. So in some sense, that's pretty traditional. Um, it's just that there's a little more heavy-handed centralized management of this. Why did you make, so why did you make this choice for the, assign, for the peer assignation as opposed to BitTor and that? Well, okay, so there's a belief that Akamai actually has some knowledge about which nodes are close to each other on the network. Okay? We try to do that anyway. So we, we try to do a good job of assigning peers that are like on the same on the same ISP, you know, in the same city. That there's some attempt to try to get good performance. So actually, or maybe that's the wrong. Let me rephrase my question. So I, okay. I can see I can see how some people believe that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with this design. Do you have any evidence that this design actually beats BitTorrent? Sort of from as a researcher. I mean I'm I'm happy, you know, I'm not like I can see now how the industry might think that oh signing peers is a good idea because we know. But is there, do we actually have that evidence? No, no, and I'm not sure that was even a motivation. I mean, beating BitTorrent was not necessarily a benchmark we were worried about. Okay, I think we're more worried about uh, the real reason for assigning peers is because it's 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 because of NAT traversal. Okay, the idea is that these peers keep an open TCP connection to us. When we decide that you're going to make a request from this peer. We send that guy a note also because it's certain types of NATs are easy, most easily traversed if both parties can try to open up things from the inside. Okay, So I think that's the real reason. NAT traversal is the real reason to have centralized control over the peer selection. So we can send messages to the peers. It's not about, uh, it's, it's not about performance. And secondarily, it's also about uh, detecting if somebody's doing something crazy. Uh, you know. You shouldn't be reporting downloads from a peer that you weren't assigned. That's a sign that you're, you're, you're trying to somehow pollute the accounting. Question, yeah? Do the peers report back on the quality of service they get from the other peers? They do. They do. They, that, and that's another thing that um, the, because they have to keep this connection open, they do report back on all the downloads they, uh, perf that, that they receive from other peers and what the quality was like. Could assume that um, you're also using the data to fine tune your uh, secret sauce to some extent. To fine tune our your secret sauce, your uh, our secret sauce. Yes. You know that's a, one of our weak trademarks. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed about that. Okay, that they still use that term 12 years later. But uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so one, uh, let me give you a small example. Um, well, I should say though that we are really careful, even though. We've got this software running on the client. 
we do not do crazy measurements from the client uh, to map out their networks. Okay? That would be viewed as, if, that, if we did that sooner or later, it would be a big stink. Okay? So there are, there are some academic projects who can do that and you know, people understand it's just an experiment. But we can't have our software, just as I'm sure Microsoft, you, you couldn't have like intrusive network scanning software in, built into Windows. At least not publicly. Um, so we, but you can look at data that you're collecting for you know for the basic operation and try to glean information like, hey, which peers are getting good performance to each other? Um, yeah, absolutely. Can I ask you? So going back to the pain for bad, we sort of, huh, do you know whether one of these peers is? You know, at a hotel using a 2495 internet connection a day. And I'm, could you distinguish between that peer and a home peer using Comcast with unlimited traffic? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, uh, two things. One is the, the client, uh, and I don't know the details of how this is implemented, but it attempts to never use more than a certain portion of the available bandwidth at the peer. So you'll get terrible performance if you try to download something from somebody who's on a, um, a slow link. And what you'll do is you'll just say, forget it, and break that connection. Um, but as far as I know, you still try. Okay? Um, uh, yeah, so I'm not, I, don't, I don't really know the details of how that's handled, but there is an effort to manage the, the bandwidth that's being consumed. There's also a promise when you install the software and you agree to, um, the, to use peer, the peer-to-peer -peer capabilities, there's a promise that you'll never be forced to upload anything that you didn't choose to download, and the number of bytes that you upload will never be more than a, a small constant factor times the number, amount of content you've downloaded. Of course, I spent many years in the theory community, so I can hide something really big inside a big O. But, uh, <laughs> Small constant factors are, are okay usually, but if you tell a student, I'm only going to adjust your grade by a small constant factor. Like, <laughs> yeah. Does Comcast get annoyed with this plan of yours to uh, make use of their this this thing that this unlimited these unlimited plans to? Um, so again, that's a. We've had discussions with ISPs, and we have not, we have not had any pushback. I mean, the hope is that this is actually synergistic. Because we keep the, the, the traffic within their network. The other thing is, there's no illegal content here. Okay? So, so uh, yeah, that's not what I was saying. No, no but it matters. Oh, it matters. Just, right? It does matter. So it's not like th this is all traffic that, it's generally traffic that, you know, that the Comcast wants their users to have good performance on. They want their users to have. Um, I would have to say that one thing I want to do, and I'll explain why we haven't done it yet is to actually verify that we're doing a good job of keeping traffic within ISPs. Um, I, I don't have the statistics on that. L let me just say, say right now, here, there are two problems with our data. One I've already mentioned, which was the GUID issue, that they're, they're being replicated, and that's polluting our sort of counts of distinct GUIDs. The other thing is that the one thing they don't log right now is they don't log um, which peer list was assigned when a request comes in. It's really annoying. Okay? So I can't look and say, oh, this peer on Comcast was told to get the file from these 25 other peers on Comcast. They promised me by December I'll have that. Okay? But I, and at that point, we can look into these questions like, should this be viewed as a benefit or a threat to ISPs? The other thing they don't log is they do report up um, uh, performance from the peer, but I have no idea why, but they didn't give us the peer's IP address in the log. So at your question, ultimately, starting in December, we'll have more of this data about performance between specific peers, but it's currently not being logged. I have no idea why. That's a, a weird omission. But it's not in the log. So it seems less important to find out what you, where you told them to download it from than where they actually did. That. Absolutely, they're both important. <laughs> yeah, they're both important. I want, I want to see, you know, I want to see where they got it from because that tells me, you know, kind of how, or, or, or sorry, who they were told to. That is supposed to be a list of 
peers that we think have the content. So it would be interesting to know, are there good candidates? Uh, yeah. So do you treat streaming data differently than non-streaming data? Uh, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, I can imagine that there are reasons to do that because with streaming data, it's important, especially if it's going to be viewed in real time, to get a prefix of the file downloaded very reliably as the person's watching it, where with non-streaming, that's not as important. Uh, I, I know they're working on that. Uh, I don't know, though, if there's any special provision. So like if I was you know, Netflix company and say, I want to host these videos, would I have a different prop? You don't know if there would be a different um, set of guarantees that I'd have you if you were exposed to like Adobe, who just wants to deliver updates? Uh, I would say we certainly have to do something. We probably have to do something different. Um, I just don't have information on that. I know they're working on that. They want to be able to deliver Netflix using this system, for example. Um, OK. Um, so logging. Now, this is something that it's really important. I think uh, academics maybe have not necessarily recognize the importance of accurate logging and accounting to the content providers. Okay? So this is something we learned early on, that the customer wants to be able to go and look and see what you did on their behalf. And if your log is screwy, they lose all trust in you, and they're not going to believe you actually provided a good service. So this is why um, the peers cannot participate in, in any peer-to-peer -peer behavior or exchanges unless they're connected and they log everything as it happens. Um, now, also, we already have, and for a long time we've had in place, you know, good, reliable logging on our own servers. So anytime a peer downloads from one of our own servers, that's fine. You know, we know that that'll get logged and, care, and, and, and collated in the right way. But um, this logging is, is a big issue here. Do you, log, do, you want to log, do you want to have them log from both sides so you can check them against each other? So that's a good question. So they are logged on both sides when you upload or download. We currently don't check them. There's not enough information, as I said, to check them in there. Because they don't, give it, they don't put the IP address of the fear in there. I don't know why. But, but I've been do, working on a system that will actually check them and look for anomalies. And, and so we'll, we're still waiting for the data. Um, OK, so here's some data about uh, the summary about the 2010 logs. Um, so just a couple of things here. There were a few dozen customers. Um, in, in, in December, there were 16 million GUIDs that logged in. There were 100, nice round number, control plane servers that were managing these. Um, this is a little different than most of Akamai's system because each of these control plane servers was managing a connection to a peer, and there were, there were a couple, possibly a couple hundred thousand being managed by each one of the servers. These are, these are uh, you know, low bandwidth interactions, but to me this seems like a, generally kind of a, looks like high impact single failures, right? On the positive side, if that connection gets broken, all that happens is the peers have to just do traditional download. So it, it shouldn't result in the, co the end user seeing much poor performance difference. Um, here's another interesting statistic over the course of that month we saw 115 million distinct IP addresses. Now remember that we see 500 million web clients a day, maybe over the course of the month, 600 million. This says that the, we've already penetrated a, you know, a, a, a sixth or maybe a little more of all the IP addresses out there that are running browsers. Okay. Now, of course, there's IP reassignment. That doesn't mean we had this many installations. There are a lot of people who's, who the same GUID comes back with different IP addresses at different days. And of course, I know Microsoft's number for Windows installations is you know, way, way, way higher. So that's fine. But it is still a it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty broad swath, especially when you start thinking about what could we learn about network connectivity when you're seeing that many different IP addresses in a month. Yeah? Is uh, the way you connect IP addresses on your PM networking system? Uh, identical to the way you collect uh, uh, IP addresses on the CDN? 
so is the definition of a client IP the same? Uh, it, I think it's essentially the same. It's in, in, the CD, in the CDN, it's the address that comes with an HTTP request. In, in this system, it's the address that comes with the TCP connection request to the control plane server. Yeah. Uh, uh, going back to before the slide, uh, you know, uh, you can leave it on screen. Uh, if you, uh, once you co uh, correlate the, the sending peer with the receiving peer, can't you essentially make up for the missing IP address by saying, you know, this IP sent 15 megabytes at midnight in three seconds, this IP received 10 megabytes at midnight in three seconds, maybe they're the same. And then you match them by the, by the packet, by their packet traffic. You, you could do that. Yeah. You, you, you could do that. They record it, they don't record it. And the other question is, are there so many countries in the world? That's on the slide you were showing. Yes. I was going to ask uh, that too. I think the UN membership is lower than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's Well, I think we put the Gazas in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let me just say that um, all the geolocation uh, data is coming from Akamai's commercial um, geolocation tool, which is called Edgescape, where you feed in an IP address and it gives you its prediction. Um, I, this does not imply that Edgescape has fictitious countries. It could be that when we analyze the data, I, I, I don't know, okay? But, but this is just output from um, Edgescape. This is, Edgescape produces, for the most part, it spits out a city name for an IP address. So locations means the number of um, uh, cities that we saw clients in. Uh, domains here means we did like a reverse DNS lookup on the client IP addresses and just looked at the, the DNS name. I, I don't know if this is really interesting. And this was also coming from Edgescape. Yeah. So going back to his question, your response was that the different, the slightly different methodology for collecting IPs was the TCP connection or the HTTP request. That maybe there are proxies that are set up where the proxy is set up where uh, when you make an HTTP request, because the proxy you get you see the proxy's IP address, but when you make a direct TCP connection, so that could explain part of why. But. It, it's possible. It could be that again. You're right. It could be that that it's more common to proxy HTTP and so that the five or 600 million we see in a month there is a little lower than it would be if we didn't have proxies. That, that's, that's true. I, I, what I was getting about, meaning that they're the same methodology, is that we should see the address after you've passed through any NAT or proxy. That is, you know, um, but, but that's pretty minor. Of, of course, that's how it works. Okay, this is a heat map showing the, the um, <coughs> where the clients seem to be. Um, it should be taken somewhat with a grain of salt because it's based on this commercial tool. Geolocation's not easy, so there's always going to be inaccuracies. I think Edgescape is a competitive tool. Now, one of the reasons that things look a little uh, distorted here is that we have much better geographical... Uh, uh, we, we can predict on a more fine scale in the U.S. than we can in other places. So we've broken, we, 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 you know, we, we, in the U.S., you don't see these giant blobs because we've actually figured out, you know, much more precisely where things are located. In some other countries, we have less information and we might, you know, in, Rio, in Brazil, think almost everybody is in Rio or Sao Paulo. I don't know if that's really true or not, but you should view this as some distortions in this picture are caused just by the granularity of the tool's ability to predict. Now, the important point, though, is if you look at this map, it does look very different from the deployment of our servers. Okay, we have clients all over Africa, clients all over Central Asia. You didn't see any servers in those places. Okay, so that you are getting a, a broader footprint here um, when, you, when you allow peers to become part of your delivery system. Uh, here's a graph, and I'm going to come back to this, but I, I thought it was kind of fun. It's, it's showing the logins per day in December. And there's something very peculiar going on around December 8th. Otherwise, it looks like it's following a very typical weekly and diurnal pattern. You know, like, my guess is this is the weekends, these are the weekdays, and, you know, for the last 12 years, if you looked at Akamai's daily aggregate traffic, it also looks exactly like that. Okay? So 
except there's something very strange here, which I think will be, be fun when I explain what happened there. Um, so uh, we, one of the things we tried to do, but I think maybe we're not s convinced we succeeded, was try to toss out GUIDs that look like they're replicated. And the way we did that was we, we flagged GUIDs if we saw multiple logins at the same time with the same GUID, or if we saw one login and then a little while later we saw another, but it would have involved travel at faster than the speed of light to get from one point to another. Uh, of course, that can be fooled by VPNs and all sorts of crazy things, but... I wanted to point out traveling faster than the speed of light. So, <laughs> the latest thing I heard, though, was that with this neutrino uh, claim is that now it appears that, and this is no surprise to anyone who works in network management, that the, the timing cards, which are just FPGAs, uh, you know, the uncertainty in, in their timing is high enough that you should be very skeptical. Okay? Uh, it's really impossible to measure time of flight of anything. Okay? We didn't, you probably didn't need Einstein to tell us that. Um, okay, so... Uh, we're kind of we're, we're making an effort here to look at number of IP addresses over a course of a month for one GUID, and um, and and we can see that for the ones that look suspicious, we're seeing some crazy numbers like, you know, like half of them are using um, twenty or thirty IP addresses over the course of a month, and that just seems too high. But when we throw those out it's much more reasonable that most of them are using a, a small number of IP addresses. This will be addressed, I think, when we get the change in to, to let us regenerate GUIDs. Yeah? So, so laptops, laptops probably see 20 new IP addresses. Some, uh, absolutely, some do. As you go to coffee shops and so forth. Yeah. There are no, there's no cell phone clients, but it is, laptops are there. So that's, that is possible. And that, so you would expect to see that sometimes. Yeah. But your desktops wouldn't, your, probably your enterprise machines don't. Um, and, you know, and then not everybody goes to as many coffee shops as, as we do, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, okay, especially in Seattle, right? Uh, okay. Uh, here's something interesting. So um, the content provider decides, and I got started a little late, so you're gonna have to give me a few more minutes. This. Oh, I'm not going to go to the top. Okay. Uh, the content pr decider decides whether or not peer-to-peer -peer should be enabled. Okay. So for Cisco, if that's the first content provider that asks you to install the download manager, there will be no whiff of the fact that peer-to-peer -peer is enabled. They don't want that word appearing anywhere. It sounds bad and dangerous. Okay. So it's not mentioned. So if you install it for them, your your software is by default um, not enabled for peer-to-peer. -peer. If you really knew what you were doing, you could go in and change it to enable it. Now, if you now go to a second content provider who wants you to use peer-to-peer, -peer, it'll pop something up and say, you've got this installed, but peer-to-peer -peer is disabled. Uh, would you like to enable it for our content? We recommend it. And um, the, uh, the user can then can then do that. And uh, it will then, it doesn't mean that this, let's say this game company talks you into turning on peer-to-peer, -peer. it doesn't mean that you'll start using peer-to-peer -peer for Cisco. Because each individual content provider still specifies whether or not they allow peer-to-peer. -peer. It just has to do with whether your client uh, is using it at all. Okay. So what we found is that, first of all, at, at this time, and I think it was because Adobe was the dominant use of this, um, and they probably had peer-to-peer -peer disabled. Only about a third um, of the, uh, the nodes were using peer-to-peer -peer uploads. But we also found that very few people ever changed the settings from what was recommended. Now, people have pointed out that this was only one month's worth of data. Okay, so... Um, it's, you know, it's hard to say whether people might have had enough time to realize that their machine is busily uploading stuff to other people and say, oh, I don't like that. The other thing is, the reality is probably 99% of the people have no idea what peer-to-peer -peer is, and it doesn't even matter how well you spell it out to them. They just don't know. 
Okay? So for whatever reason, though, they're not changing it. Well, at least we didn't see that. They, they're just accepting whatever's recommended. Okay, so here's some data about file sizes. What I looked at here was I, I looked at only the customers, at this time about a dozen, that were using peer-to-peer. -peer. And I looked at the median file sizes. Now, there were two customers that were using it and were, and were downloading relatively small files. So they're, they're looking at sort of 10 megabytes. But all the other customers, the median file size was 872 megabytes. Okay, and this is what it's, it's targeted at downloads of over 100 megabytes. That's, that's sort of what the product is, is aiming for. And we do see that there are customers out there. And I, I asked about this. I said, that seems crazy, right? And what I was told was, well, some of that is, is canned video. And some of that, a lot of it is games. And they're really that big. How long do you wait to download that? Well, it depends. I mean, it might be going on in the back road, background in some applications. It, it, it might be that you need it to play the game and you just sit there and wait. Yeah. And it depends on your network. It depends on the upload capabilities of your peers. Um, I'm going to show you some statistics about how often people give up and what are the reasons for failure. Um, but first, I, I want to introduce this term efficiency, which means the percentage of bytes um, that are actually served by peers versus the infrastructure. So again, these are the largest customers in terms of bytes served that have peer-to-peer -peer enabled. And, and green here are the number of percentage of bytes served by peers. Red is percentage of bytes coming off the infrastructure. And you see that there's sort of in this 70 to 80% range of the bytes are being served by peers and not from the infrastructure. That means that the, the, you know, the files that people are interested in are actually common enough that you can find peers that have the data who are currently logged in. Um, it means that it's, it's reducing the, the bill for the customer, at least the, it's reducing by a factor of four or five what they're paying for bytes delivered by the infrastructure. Does that depend on the insulation? It depends on the insulation cost, that's right. Can you speak about revenue last year to peer to peer? <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know because it's hard to say. You know, some of these customers just couldn't do it. They couldn't, they couldn't make a profit if they went with traditional infrastructure downloads. So it, you know, this may be this plus the licensing fee is revenue gain, maybe. Or you're enabling people to do things like the games to update more frequently than they would before. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I. Um, no, Marge, but I, if I'm the customer, I may want to have another thing. Question. Another thing that at Microsoft you should appreciate full well, okay, is that the absolute most important thing is not to lose a customer, okay, because most of our money does not come just from delivering bits. More than sixty percent of the revenue is from value-added services, special features, okay. We've spent twelve years learning about how these, you know, thirty thousand different websites, how they all do things a little differently, and all the bells and whistles they want. And we can charge them for all sorts of other things than bit delivery. Bit delivery is becoming a very commoditized business. Those guys at Conviva are not helping matters, right? They're making it so that one content provider can play off multiple CDNs and you know pick whichever one is cheapest and giving good performance. And so you, the last thing you want to do is give up a customer. Okay, that's more important than losing a little bit of the revenue for bit delivery. Here's my question. How is the performance measured in this infrastructure versus peer-to-peer uh, sense? So, I mean, for example, if I'm the customer, how I'm confident when I have 20% bit delivered from infrastructure, that's the right decision the software is making? Ah, okay, well, um, you know, the customers are not going to be able to go into the logs and figure out that that was really the best we could do. Okay? They're going to have to look at the bottom line and say, okay, well, that cut off 80% of my bill for bit delivery. Is that enough for me? Um, you know, that's, uh, what they will be able to do, though, is we can give them statistics about performance. We can give them statistics about success rate. And so they'll get a, kind of a composite picture. Um, I do not believe we have any customers who, who are complaining that we delivered too many bits off the infrastructure. That, that just doesn't seem, when they see that we cut it down by 80%, they, that's good. Yeah. Do you 
have an intuition for whether you have increased or decreased total energy use? Because instead of using most efficient server server room cool efficiently cooled server rooms, you're relying on machines that people bought without regard to energy efficiency. Well, it's a good question. Although I don't think anybody is leaving their machine on because we want we ask right, them to. Right. So you could also turn off your servers if they were under underutilized. It's just a matter of the incremental CPU network load on their machines versus yours. What what is the balance? Well, okay. Yeah. So first of all, I don't, I don't know, and I think it's a very tricky question to answer. I, I think at first glance, we can turn off our servers because they're not being used as much. Whereas these guys are leaving their desktops, and sometimes their laptops logged in all the time anyway. And generally speaking, if you look at Today's hardware, the incremental cost to do an upload is, in terms of energy, is pretty tiny once you've got the machine on anyway. That may change in the future, but I, my guess is that at the moment this is an energy saving proposition. But as we have more proportional use of energy, that might change. Yeah? You said that uh, bid deliver is a small part of, of Akamai revenue. So no, what, what percentage I, is it of, of no, that? No, no, I didn't. Well, it's probably 40%. 40%. It's not a small part, but it's not the dominant part anymore. Okay, what this is showing is how pure efficiency changes as a, a, as a function of the number of peers that were returned or suggestions of who you can get the content from. Now, there's just an artificial limit of 40. That's what the software does. It never returns more than 40. Here's a histogram showing, you know, number of peers that are returned. It's on a log scale. We rarely return zero, but sometimes we don't know of anyone else who has the file or maybe it's a brand new file. Um, 40 is the most common. You know, typically we actually have more than 40. We just cut it off at 40. Uh, and it's kind of an amazingly flat curve there. I, I don't know why. Um, you can also see that in terms of efficiency, there's a uh, kind of a diminishing return somewhere around 15, 20 peers. Okay, at that point, you, you're probably you know, getting as much efficiency as you're going to get. Uh, here's success rates for all downloads. Um, so one of the things we see is that success rates are a function of the size of the file um, and that generally success rates are higher for uh, smaller files. Uh, it's a, these are a little, maybe a little inverted from what you might expect. Um, when you don't succeed, we broke it into two categories, and those are terminated, which means that the, the user took some action. They, they, um, uh, they shut down the software, or they stopped the download. Failed means that, you know, as far as we could tell, everyone was trying as hard as they could, and it just failed. Um, so overall, the success rate was 86%. This, you could view this as a good or a bad number. It sounds kind of bad, right? But you got to remember, some of these files are gigantic, okay? And there's a lot of reasons why you might terminate a one gigabyte download in the middle that are not related to the system performing badly. It just might take too long, right? It, might, it just might be that your network connection is so slow, it's going to take a long time to get that, regardless of whether everything else is working well. So uh, I think overall this is... It would be nice to bring these numbers up, but I, I don't think that they're too surprising. How does this compare to without people? I don't have that number. So that would be, that'd be a great number to know. Uh, here's another statistic that when there is a termination or failure, we're plotting it as a function of how much of the file was downloaded. Okay? This is really bad. <laughs> right? When you fail, when you're like 80% done and then you fail, that's really painful. Uh, but I guess it's mostly good news that the failures and the terminations tend to come early. Okay? So at least there's not as much wasted effort. This, this graph is plotting um, <coughs> performance looking at two classes of downloads. So on, on two different uh, residential ISPs. So uh, the, the, the red and and the blue here, these are the edge-only curves. These are content that's being pulled 
entirely from Akamai Edge servers, no peer-to-peer. -peer. And this is, these are content where at least 50% of the bytes came from peers. So what do you see here? It's slower. It's, it's considerably slower. Okay. Well, that's just, okay, that's what the numbers show. Now, on the positive side, even though it is slower, you're still seeing the majority are here in the, you know, uh, three megabits per second. Okay, it's not a slow download. It's slower than here, but it's it's not so bad. Right, especially when you think about these people probably mostly do. Well, I, I doubt that they they on average have three megabits upload capacity. So you're really taking advantage of the swarming protocol's ability to use aggregate upload capacity. Well, I, I, this is just the aggregate statistics. I, I don't know. Um, one of the things that we're doing some experiments with is um, trying to see. We've, we've found that if we replace slow peers with edge servers, we can sometimes get these curves to invert. But there's a big cost in efficiency. So there's, because we might have to go to like 50% bytes delivered from edge servers. And that is, the moment is not the trade off we want to make. But we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try to include some new data when we write this paper that kind of shows. Is there, um, so on that, is, is there a demand for any kind of quality of service on peer to peer? Like for you to actually just manage completion times rather than like a binary decision between peer to peer and uh, infrastructure? Uh, so, not we're not getting strong push for that from the customers right now. But do you feel you if if you did like you know enough about the network on the edges to be able to say okay you know we're gonna try and deliver this a gigabit file. So I, I'm not super confident of that, but I do know you could do some simple things like just rule out peers that you know are a lot slower than the infrastructure. You, that you could do, and that would that would help. Um, as I said, I think. We need more data to be able to figure out how well we're doing already at getting the downloads from peers that are nearby and getting good performance. And, and I just don't have that data. OK, this is a content popularity. It's, it's looking at um, the, the files are sorted uh, according to how often they were downloaded. And this is a log log scale. Uh, Again, it's a relatively small number of customers, although there were a lot of different URLs, a couple hundred thousand. And I don't know what anyone ever gets out of these plots, but to me, this looks typical. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's nothing weird here. Uh, you know, it's a heavy tail distribution, maybe, but it's definitely got this sort of 80 20 rule. There's a small number of things that are super popular. Okay, now I want to go and talk about. What happened December 8th? OK, so these are the different versions of the software that were seen uh, on different days in December. So the other is an Apple version, and there was no, op there was no update to the Apple client-side software. But, but we were running, at the start of the month, Windows version 1.6.3.2 RC3, and then it looks like on December 7th, we replaced that with uh, version RC4. Now, we're supposed to be building the best download manager in the world here, right? So we at least ought to be able to really successfully download a copy of ourself and install it. And that we can do, OK? So we really got everybody off almost you know, very quickly onto this new version. All right. This is the other thing is unlike Windows updates, we don't give the user the choice of whether they want to install it. They're just it happens in the background. They're forced to install a new version. There's a check every time they log in, and you know they're forced to install. But what this looks like is there was some bug in the code, right? Something something catastrophic. So they released a new version the next day, and that didn't fix the bug. <laughs> so they released a new version the next day. And that didn't fix the bug. So then they got a stable version finally out, uh, and that, that held for the rest of the month. Okay? So ugh, this, this is an example of a, a kind of an engineering disaster. Uh, 
But it, what is interesting is the quick ability to switch everybody onto a new version of the software, right? You, you can log them out. The next time they log in, they're forced to upload. Uh, sorry, forced to upgrade. Otherwise, they can't, they can't proceed. Looking back, it seems that Brown Knight is yeah, RC1 right. and RC2. Do you go back? No, no. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe this. That's good. Thank you. I'm going to check on that. I don't think that's right. But, uh, but in any case, yeah, that was definitely, it's not standard industry practice to roll out four versions of the software in four days. That's a bad idea. Is it possible for them to roll out the new software to just a subset of them so they can see whether there's these problems? Or... I, I'm sure that they do that. Uh, and it just didn't, it didn't work, right? And that is, that is our company's practice. Whenever we roll out software, uh, at least on the CDN, we roll it out to a few machines and a few clusters and then, yeah. So maybe these guys are learning the same lessons <laughs> that we learned from that. How uh, much is a piece of software? Mm -hmm. This piece, I assume it's a pretty small piece. Yeah, right? it's pretty small. I don't know the, I could go look, but um, it's not a big piece of software. 100 kilobytes. No, it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. you, you know, most of the software is about mat traversal. That's what, that's what most of it is about. Right, that's you got to figure out all different kinds of gnats and how you get through them. Uh, okay, so I'm going to finish now. Just going to say that um, one of the things I've been working on, separate from this, uh, is strategies for protecting the logging system against attacks, protecting against adversaries who just want to make you look silly when you report your statistics to your customers. You know, to, to if the customers lose confidence in in what you're doing, that's a big problem. Um, so one of the things we did was we showed how to report arbitrarily large amounts of downloads to the system without even modifying the client with the sort of man in the middle attack. Um, we actually have the patch for that in the works. Um, but uh, generally speaking, these are, these are hard to, to defend against. And one of the technologies we're using is tamper evident logs and being able to check when you have peers reporting things that uh, they're being consistent about what they're reporting, that, that the reports uh, are not um, showing any violations of our protocols. Um, I think in general this is a very hard problem to solve because you're never going to prevent sometimes peers managing to get assigned to each other when they're actually colluding. And at that point, like all bets are off. But you can try to mitigate that. You can try to make it less likely that that will happen. You can put in statistical analysis. And one of the cool things is that you can have tests with a high false positive rate. Because all that happens, if you find some anomalous behavior and you think this is suspicious, you just turn off peer-to-peer, -peer and the client goes to the infrastructure, and they still get the files. It's just their ability to, to then, if they are being malicious, to mess with the logs goes away. Yeah. You're you doing this as a proactive defense, or you actually see people beginning to notice Akamai Download Manager and starting to fool it for fun and profit? We don't know. Uh, it's proactive. We don't, we don't know of any examples where it's being done, but we also really don't know how we would tell. I mean, of course, there's a lot of, a lot of defensive engineering already goes into these things. This is just putting a little more effort in that direction. We've got Andreas Taberlin working on, on, on this. Presumably, this is probably very interesting. Yeah. So Andreas, Andreas, you know, has done this work on peer review and net review, and so it's it's looking at applying some of the same technology. Final question. Yeah. What's your prediction on Akamai stock? I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it goes up and it goes down. Um, you know, since I'm being videotaped, I, I can't really say anything. Uh, I will say that if there's an unusually large amount of insider ownership of the comp company still for a company with our market cap and our, our age. So, um, you know, that's, that makes things, you know, a little bit, maybe a little more stable. Um, I don't think anyone in this room wants to joke about stock prices. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
video. <laughs> yeah. I, I will quote Bill Gates who once said, maybe the stock will double, maybe it will halve. Talking about Microsoft, about that company. Yeah, that's how I feel. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it goes up and it goes down. It doesn't seem to be related to profits, which seem to be steady, steadily growing. I know the talk is mainly about basically deliver content through peer to peer. How, um, I mean, during the study, do you observe the performance of the network? Meaning, um, I mean, for example, let's say the user is using an application which is uh, performance sensitive. When you think about the games, uh, the play impact portion, rather than download portion, void video conference, yeah. these kind of apps. Um, I mean, they basically, I mean, they need to understand the network behavior way. How do you think, I mean, how well do you think Akamai understand the network behavior? Um, anything, basically, any observations you have on that? Well, so, not much. I mean, one thing is, we, we cannot collect statistics about what the user is doing on their machine. That's just out of bounds. We can't do that. Um, so, I, I can say that. The, the, the mechanisms for trying to ensure that we don't use too much of the available bandwidth have been thoroughly tested, but I don't know that it's ever gone beyond that as sort of, well, you know, that's going to be good enough. Um, I'm not, obviously, there are going to be situations where a peer-to-peer -peer upload that you're providing may impact what else, whatever else you're doing on your machine. We've probably, if you run Skype, you probably see this occasionally. Or maybe you don't know why, but your machine just slowed down. Something came up like so. So a lot of people talk about bandwidth caps now. Like it seems to be back in vogue for some reason. Like, do you talk about like in-band or out-of-band signaling with residential ISPs to to make sure in the future the download manager is not hitting the customer's bottom line? Well, we don't do that now. Um, again, we do have this. We do limit the amount of upload to be a small multiple of the download. Now that by itself, that doesn't promise that you wouldn't impact their their bill, uh, but but it does put some limits on how much damage we could do to the bill. Uh, so that's as far as it's gone, as far as I know. But you're not having a conversation that is easy to. Um, that's an interesting idea. We're sort of separate work with Anya Feldman's group. We have been talking about how CDNs and ISPs can collaborate better. That idea had not been brought up before, though. It's an interesting one um, to help sort of manage end users' total bandwidth consumption. I Had, hadn't thought of that before. Especially, I, I think it's especially important because it comes in the form of caps, right? Like I have a 400 megabyte quota per month and then the, the other 20 bytes actually cost a lot more, like right? going from 400 to 420. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to optimize for that unless you have some information around quotas and what the limits are. Right, and, yeah. right. And the other thing is, there may be a lot of sensitivity from the ISPs about providing that information. You know, I, you know, details of your contract with individual customers from the ISP side, I, 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 maybe for a research project, but in terms of putting that into production, I, I don't know. It seems, I, I, I don't know, but it sounds, sounds a little hard to fathom. Today, such information is in a web page. Um, you need the information to be a programmable interface. So you can query your ISP says how much I have used my quota. Right. And then I mean, we'll be able to do some stuff. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. If, if the software, the client side software could ask, hey, what, how's our quota looking? That'd be very interesting if, if an ISP yeah. would provide that interface. Yeah. Has, that, has anyone talked about that? Um, that's a cool idea. Uh, I think I've heard talk about, like, in the operating system context, I think. Um, to some extent, I think on the cell phone, like cell sure. phone operating operating system would like to have that ability. Yeah, to that's be cool. able to signal with three G carriers, like that come to the two gigabyte limit per month. Where does the client stand? Well, they know where the client stands, but they don't know what the client's billing contract with the uh, data provider is. And getting some insight into that, then you can optimize, the, you know, what's critical, what should wait for Wi Fi, and things like that. Question. This is very paranoid, but maybe cheap. Rather than just hash the blocks, have you considered prepending a random and then hashing the blocks? It will stop some of the more fanciful attacks if the hash functions are weak. Yeah, so uh, I didn't say so, but uh, the other thing that 
another thing that happens is that there's a nonce sent between when, when two peers are assigned to talk to each other, each one gets a nonce. And you can check that, that at least the person talking to you got the same nonce that mm -hmm. you got. So I think it's good to be paranoid. I think we need to be more paranoid. Uh, I, I think also, though, you know, luckily, again, this is a case where no matter how much they screw this up, we're not actually billing right now anyway. There's no customers being billed by the byte served. And, and if you think someone's suspicious, you just dump them out of the peer-to-peer -peer system. So they're, the fact that this is probably, in the end, uh, an unsolvable problem, uh, you know, is at least the impact of, of those who are clever enough to get around your solutions should be limited. Yeah. Yeah, I work in network security here, and we're seeing a large problem with not just your client, but other clients, right? When there's, there, people are making um, solving clients without understanding what their behavior is, and then and then having them use our bandwidth to do peer, -peer traffic when it's actually against the policy. And it's, it's not only that, but it also makes anomaly detection much more difficult. Yeah. It's only connecting to all these networks that were never agreed to. Right. Especially in high. Well, I think networks. the cat's out of the bag. Yeah. Okay. Peer to peer downloading has been out there uh, for so long now. Uh, I mean, yeah, we're piling on maybe, but um, yeah, it's, it's that, that's... Something you have to deal with, right? Yeah. Um, my question is, um, how do you contract, uh, protect the control plane? How do you protect the control plane? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, the, the, the it's basically a protection just through, first of all, the impact of a control plane server going down, say someone takes it down with a DDoS attack or something, the worst thing it does is it shuts off peer-to-peer -peer for those clients who then reconnect to another one. So that's one nice thing about it is that the, the, the failure model is not so bad. Um, but generally, the control plane is just protected by having excess capacity in a geographically diverse set of places. Okay. Um, Possible well, I certainly hope not. I mean, that's that's. But we don't do anything that anybody. We do, you know, industry standard techniques to protect those servers, just like anybody else would. The control plane servers are in more secure locations. They're not. They're, those are deployed in major commercial data centers. They're not in places where we don't have any physical security. Yeah. Uh, don't please don't do that without checking with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for your